let's keep it real. Let's keep going here. Um, we have our first presenter. Isn't that awesome? The music in the background? Matt is on the ball up there. Is it? Okay, all right. So, um, we have Heidi Fensel. Heidi is a uh, professor of physics at UWGB. She's been asking questions uh, in considering the state of education, <laughs> occupation, in an advancing technological world that we're living in. So please welcome Heidi to the stage. My big concern is if I can run a microphone. So this is my grandpa Shield. And when I was about 11 years old, I realized that he was born before the first flight and lived to see people land on the moon. And I was very, very sad because I knew that nothing in my life would undergo the same incredible kind of transformation. <laughs> and of course, when I, that was our first computer, by the way. Um, when I transferred this slide showing the kind of transformation that the computer has had in my life, it was impossible. So I can put down you know, a road atlas and say, hey, on my phone, I have Google Maps now. I don't need an atlas. But it hasn't just replaced the atlas. It's replaced how I navigate. Um, you know, so Siri is up there as a placeholder for the fact that computers have changed everything that we do. So as you know from the poster, the question that I want you to think about first, and think about this on your way home, um, in the next decade or so, do you expect the professional and you could be replaced by a computer? And if you use your hands, no, I'll let you have a robot. Uh, and if you don't end up with a career existential crisis, think about it a little bit harder. <laughs> So it's really easy, you know, the most recent study I could find found that about five and a half times as many jobs are going to technology as overseas. And it's very, very easy to look and say, oh, it's, it's manufacture. But when you think about it, it's everything. It's the service industry, it's manufacture, it is professions. Um, there's a large-scale medical trial, for example, right now, going on looking at um, computer diagnoses versus those by trained medical professionals. It is a crazy and changing and exciting world. And I know that I'm not the only educator in this room, um, but the question that comes to me, and I think about all the time, is how do I help to prepare my students? And for those of you who are students, how do you prepare for a world that we cannot even imagine? Um, and to start to think about that question, because I have to, is what I do, I want to talk a little bit about what we know about the brain. And most of you have heard, I'm sure, that you can keep seven items in short-term memory. Um, short-term memory is working memory. That's where we do our thinking, where we solve our problems, where, where we figure things out. And there is a case, by the way, here for um, rote memorization. Because if you know something, you can bring it in and out of working memory very, very easily. So there's a little bit of a case there. But there's also a case that what a thing is, what an item is, can grow and change as you practice. So the most concrete example that I have, because we can all visualize it, is playing guitar. And when you first learn to play guitar, every finger is an item. You have to keep track of that chord, whatever it might be. But after that chord becomes an item, and you practice more, then patterns become items. So the 12 bar blues, for example, could become an item. And you can become more complex in what you do. So this picture here, a few years ago, um, my husband and I went to Dublin and went to a musical pub crawl, which was wonderful, I recommend it. Uh, and I didn't know a lot about session music. But as they described it, you know, people come in and play. You're expected to be coming into the pub to play. And of course you play with people, you know, similar people all the time, but if a stranger comes in, they're expected to play too. And they were joking that the most common tune in Irish music is let's start with a G, go to a C, and see what happens from here. And that, and that works. Because if you know as chunks, as items, basic musical patterns and basic rhythms, then all that you need to notice is what's the same and what's different, and you can do that kind of creative processing. So what does that mean for my pre-medical and pre-health science students stuck in my physics class? <laughs> We're doing a similar kind of thing. So physics has a very particular, you know, unique to a discipline as everything does, way of reasoning, way of thinking about problems. We use representations verbally. What's the main physics here? We use representations in pictures. Let me reduce the world, reduce the universe to only those pieces that are relevant to my problem. Let me reuse uh, mathematical representations. And originally, each one of those is a bunch of items in working memory. 
But if I can get making the picture one working item, and then if that whole process of the second law problem is one item, I can start to do baby steps with creative thinking with my students in class. Can I can get problems that aren't just Newton's second law, but involve other pieces too. And that opens up the idea that critical thinking and thought processes that we develop and practice and reason become chunks and they free part of our brain for creative thinking, which is where it's really at. And back to that question, that existential career crisis question, I talked to my friends in computer science and my friends who study the brain, and their um, sort of consensus is that, yeah, computers, if, if they haven't already out critically thought us, it's happening right now. But in terms of creative thinking, the human brain still has it. So when we think creative thinking, you know, it's really easy to say, oh, the arts and humanities. Um, one of my least favorite pet peeve phrases in the human language or the English language is, it's, it's not an art, it's a science. Science is an art, it's a creative process. Any complex and interesting problem is a creative process. And just as the diversity of communication that our art produces is richer for a diversity of artists, our richness of understanding of the world and the knowledge that we produce is richer for a diversity of scientists. And you know, even the National Science Foundation, this is a traditional organization, has recognized for decades that when we teach science as a body of facts, or any subject as a body of facts, we turn away the very students who can most creatively and most interestingly solve our problems. So what do I do then as a teacher, right? Um, we inherited an educational model that is of and for the Industrial Revolution. It was intended to create interchangeable workers in an assembly line type mentality. Um, and as we looked in this creative information age and says, this isn't right anymore. We care about education. Let's do something about it. What have we done? We have standardized tested until we can't standardize test anymore. We have introduced Common Core curriculum that was not designed by educators or by developmental psychologists. And when we don't have time and money and resources to do it all, very often what goes away are things like foreign language in grade school and the arts. The very things that we know build brain structure, not only for mathematical reasoning, not only for critical thinking, um, not only for our creative thinking, but also for things like anxiety reduction. So, and I've missed what my time is back there, I'll try to watch it. It's all right, I'm going to keep going. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so what do we need then? Well, we don't have any large scale um, examples, but we have a lot of small scale examples. We have a lot of inkling of what we need to do. So yes, we do need basic critical thinking skills. They allow us to have the ability to think creatively as well. Um, the assembly line model that we're doubling down on with these standardized tests is exactly what we don't need. Our teams do not need interchangeable people. We need people with their strengths that they bring and contribute to the team. We need curiosity. If I had that magic wand and could give one gift to my students, it would be curiosity. And that means we need time and support to explore and inquire. And we see things like that with Project Einstein in the elementary schools. We see it in high schools and in colleges as we have more open-ended labs or flipped courses where students get basic content from technology and have time in class to explore and be curious. And of course, it matters that we put a priority and a premium on STEAM education. So how does that happen? How do we make that happen? We talk to educators. We ask people who are there in the trenches, in the classroom. We ask innovators, people who say, how can we, instead of, we never have, right? Those are the kinds of people that need to be involved if we truly want an educational system that is right for STEAM, that is right for this creative uh, information age. And we need community support. And so many of you are educators. The rest of you are here as interested people in your clearly education is a priority here. If you have time, Read Schools Cannot Do It Alone is a fantastic book about the importance and what can happen with community support. And if you don't have time, just Google the Blueberry Story. 
and you'll find it, and you'll get a quick story for you there as well. I am actually on your time. I'm delighted by that. Um, I truly, you're lucky. I could have talked about this for hours. So, so let's take a couple minutes now. I would like to um, talk to you, questions you have now, and I would love to um, talk with you at the reception after. Casey, that was recorded, right? Oh, yeah. Because that was the bomb dig. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So questions for Heidi, raise your hand, please. Okay, don't be afraid to be the first one. Someone, someone has to. Yeah, yes, sir. So what are we going to do about standardized testing? <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing is we really need to step back. And, and I, I do not promise easy answers on this, right? It comes, it comes from the communities. It comes from people saying we actually want real reform in education. Um, we are not going to get rid of it if we're taking it the easy way. If we're looking for the way to give a degree, a diploma, a graduation rather than an education. Um, if, you know, even, even in the book, they're not going to tell you, hey, this was the easy answer. But they give some real examples. When communities value schools and communities stand together for the importance of the schools, that's the only way it's going to be. And it's big, right? We're talking not just you know this school or this state, but nationally we have education policy that roots back to the Industrial Revolution and little tweaks aren't, aren't going to do it. I saw, uh, uh, I'll catch you there, I saw another hand here, I thought. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just wondering how you came to this enlightened perspective. Um, I've been teaching for 30 years. And, and truly, I, mean, I, I do. My main course that I teach is physics to students who don't want to take physics. And, and that's true. And, and I chose that intentionally. I came to UW Green Bay, which does not have a physics major, because I love teaching students who don't really want to take physics. Because they are, no, they are wonderful, creative people. These are people who are going to be your health professionals, for example. They are dedicated, excited, creative students. Um, but they don't want to be there. So that means that my job is to take that class and say, why are you here? How can I encourage you to actually want to learn this, to be glad to be here? So I think that in many ways, maybe I focus on sort of the why of my class and a meta level of analysis more than I would if I was teaching to physics majors. So it's a lot of thinking, and I tell you, I'm fascinated by the brain. As we're getting functional MRIs and seeing it is fascinating. Me. So that's the other piece. Yes, sir. Honey, I was just wondering, you know, like with AI, they're saying yes. like 2050, oh, yes. like half of the world's population is going to be unemployed. Do you have any ideas about how our creative thinking what we will be doing, say, at 2050. Yeah. You know, in, ter in terms of the economy, what are our jobs going to be? No, I don't. That's part of this challenge of educating for a world I can't envision. But I will say the problems that we're encountering, right? They're really large-scale problems that matter to the health and safety globally. You know, if you talk about global warming, whatever it might be, these are problems that require creativity. Computers are not going to fix that. And so, jobs, economy, I have no idea, but I do know that it matters. Yes, ma'am. How do you feel about project-based learning models? I like them. I like them very much. A lot of medical schools, it was project-based learning was the question. A lot of medical schools are going to things like that as well, at least to sort of case study and flip classes. Um, there was, I wish I remembered more detail about this. There's a case someone, if anyone knows, please speak up, um, sort of left computers out for kids and the things that kids taught themselves, just out of curiosity, was crazy. Um, when you engage, you have to engage the um, drive to care and project-based learning. But absolutely, it's how our brains are wired to learn. How are we doing on time? Okay. Okay. So we can take another question or two if anyone has them. Any more questions in the back? Anybody? Okay. okay thank, thank you, you so much. much.